you this afternoon. What gets you out of bed in the morning? What gets your juices flowing? What gets you pumped up? What gives you energy to face the day, to overcome the challenges that you face during the day? Well, if you're like me, there's a lot of things that interest you. There's a lot of things you'd like to do, a lot of things you'd like to see. But all of those things, they can be things that distract us from what matters most. When I was getting ready to get married to my wonderful wife, Heather, I had just graduated uh, the previous summer from seminary. I'd gotten two degrees in seminary. I had gone through summers, taking as much as 24 credit hours at a time, working as a youth pastor in a church of 1,800 people, serving on the seminary student government, uh, went on a mission trip where I taught a Bible college level class for uh, two of them during a month in Bangladesh. We got engaged, we courted one another, we uh, bought a house, and we got the wedding together and planned, and that in itself is a lot already. For those of you who are getting married, you know. And we got married over Heather's fall break. That morning, uh, the morning of our rehearsal, she did her Greek midterms, and we did our rehearsal that night, got married the next day. And I can honestly say, I had been so busy for so long, and I worked so hard even the day of my wedding that I didn't enjoy getting married. Isn't that sad? Isn't that terrible? It is sad, I agree. <laughs> because... We can get so busy in all of the things that happen in our life and all the goings on, we can miss what matters the most. And we can only live shadows of the lives that God intends for us. How's your life going today? Are you riding the, the pinnacle and the peak of all that God has for you? Or does that whole idea seem like a dream or a, a distant memory? How are things right now? Are you living according to what matters most? Do you have something that gets you out of bed in the morning or is it just another day that you're punching the alarm clock and getting another 10 minutes of sleep before you have to crawl into the shower? Probably most of us, right? Well, on the path of life, we need God's help to know what we need to do day to day, what really matters and where we should focus our time our energy, and our attention. And a great model for that are the lives of the apostles. We've been going through the 80s series. We've been looking at the book of Acts. And today, if you have a Bible and you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 4, we're going to park in Acts 4. We'll be there most of the day. And two weeks ago, or rather last week, Pastor Bill talked about Acts 2, the day of Pentecost when God poured out his spirit on the church. And then in Acts 3, we read about what happens next. Peter and John go to the temple and they heal a man who had been crippled, who had been lame from birth, could not walk, and he starts walking and jumping. And it gives Peter the chance to preach. And Acts 4 picks up right at the end of Peter's sermon. And it reads, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. And looking at that passage, that is the first time that the church gets official notice. The notice of theological, political powers that be. And it involves Peter and John, and if you were here on Pentecost, or pardon me, not Pentecost Sunday, on Easter Sunday, you'll remember that Peter and John always kind of had a little thing between them. you remember they raced each other to the tomb, and John was asking, well, you know, I'm the, or saying, I'm the disciple that, that Jesus loves. And Peter said, well, what about him? Is he going to die before me? And there was always some kind of thing. But here we see them united together. And we see them united in persecution. And they were being persecuted because they proclaimed boldly the resurrection of Jesus 
from the dead, and they had the audacity not only to proclaim it, but to do it right from the very nerve center of Israel, of the ancient Jewish nation, the temple. They proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus in the hub of political and theological power, and it stirred people up, and it got them arrested and thrown in jail. And I can only imagine what they were feeling that night when they were in jail as they waited to be tried the next morning. Again, it was probably only two to three months after Jesus himself had been arrested and put in jail, possibly by the same people, possibly in the same cell. If you remember, Acts begins right at the end of the Gospels. As a matter of fact, Luke wrote both Luke and Acts, and it's one long narrative. We just split them up into two books. And so as they were in that jail cell, they had a lot of opportunities to be afraid. Jesus had been arrested and convicted of blasphemy and the intent to cause sedition, and he was crucified, he was executed because of his crimes. And I can only imagine that Peter and John, as they're in that cell, are thinking, wow, what's gonna happen to us tomorrow? And they had the opportunity to either give in to those fears or to live according to what really matters. And if they had given in to their fears, I don't think we'd ever have heard of them again. But they did live according to what matters, and because of that, their influence increased. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, whatever you do, you need courage. Whatever course you decide upon, there is always someone to tell you that you are wrong. There are always difficulties arising that tempt you to believe your critics are right. To map out a course of action and to follow it to an end requires some of the same courage that a soldier needs. Peace has its victories, but it takes brave men and women to win them. Even in very difficult situations, the Spirit of God can give us the courage that we need. Peter and John needed that courage in that jail cell, and I believe that the Spirit of God was there with them, and he was giving them what they needed to testify to what mattered the most so they would see their influence continue to rise. What about you? Have you ever needed God's courage for something? Are you facing something even right now that would take God's courage for you to make it through it? Well, just like Peter and John, there's two choices. We can shrink back from what really matters the most, and we'll probably be okay in that situation. Or we can stand up and say, no, there is something that matters, and I'm part of that team, and see our influence grow as we take a bold stand. Peter and James were given supernatural courage by God, and we read about it in chapter five, or pardon me, verse five. It says, the next day the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, were there, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought to them and began to question them. By what power or name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone which you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so that next morning, as they came out of jail, they were brought into the judgment chambers, and there in the judgment chambers, much as we saw in the movie, there would have been a semicircle of judgment, and in that semicircle of judgment, there would have been three groups of people. There would have been the elders, who were the, the lay political leaders of the area, 
There would have been the scribes who were lawyers, most likely part of the Pharisaic party. And then there would have been the rulers, the Sanhedrin, part of the Sadducees. And as they faced those people, they had boldness, just as Jesus had promised them they would. In Luke 21, verse 15, Jesus says, I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. And that's exactly what happened for Peter and John. After Peter said what he said in his, in his defense, the Bible tells us that the judges saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. And they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. And just as an aside, if you see, he was there. He didn't come in later, but anyway. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and then they conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from threading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak any longer anything in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. And so, here we see the most clear task of the church illustrated, and that is to share what we have seen and heard, to witness what it is that we've experienced. Peter and John, as the judges looked at them, they said, these guys are unschooled, which meant they hadn't been to rabbi training camp. I think it's called rabbinic school, actually. And so they weren't officially allowed to say or teach anything about theology. And in fact, they, they weren't really equipped to do it, according to their background. They were ordinary people, which means they were not part of the lay groups that helped rule or govern. They had no political influence or power. And the judges marveled that men like that would have such words. And when they looked at them, they realized they had been with Jesus. Now, some of us may feel a lot like Peter or John, unschooled, uneducated, however we want to say it, common folks. Others of us may have three and four advanced degrees and be hanging on to the levels of power in Washington. But no matter who we are, no matter where we are, we can understand that unless we have God's spirit, we will never be sufficient for the plan that God has for us or have everything we need when we come to those places where we're out of our league because we will all find ourselves as God calls us into greater and greater influence out of our league somewhere, somewhere where we don't have everything we need to stand and be the testimony to what matters most, and we have so much to lose. And in that place where we're not sufficient and we have so much to lose, we can know that there is someone who goes with us and will embolden us and strengthen us and will give us the words to say. I hope that I'm never in a place where I have to stand trial like Peter and John. I hope that I'm never in a place where I'm being walked along the sea in an orange uniform by the terrorist group ISIS 
like many of our brothers and sisters we've seen in the news. But if that's ever me, if that's ever you, we can know that in those circumstances, even in those circumstances, there is a comforter, there is someone who comes alongside, not only to pat us on the back and tell us it's all going to be okay, but to embolden us and encourage us and allow us to stand for what really matters. And Peter and John knew what really mattered. As they said in verse 20, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And so the Spirit gives courage. Does anybody need courage today for something you're facing? Something in a relationship, something in a job situation, something in your finances? The Spirit gives courage. But the Spirit also gives, as we'll see in Acts, community. You're getting a twofer today. And we read that on their release, starting in verse 23, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And then we'll skip ahead to verse 30. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And then the Bible tells us, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And so, the Spirit gives courage, the Spirit also brings community and power, and you notice that even as Jesus had told them to do, they were there together. And they were praying for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will send the Spirit. He said, ask for the Spirit. And your Father in heaven, who loves you like children, won't give you snakes or stones. He will give you what you ask. Ask for the Spirit, and it will be given. And you notice they're together. They're asking for the Spirit. And what happens? The place is shaken, and all were filled with the Spirit. And what were they doing other than being obedient? They were reconnecting with what matters most. They were reconnecting with the great story of God. All the way back, they said, God, you're the creator. This thing goes all the way back to the beginning. And your son came and he died and was resurrected and he sent his spirit and we're experiencing it. And they were getting reconnected to their head. They were getting reconnected to God. They were getting re vitalized. So many times we think of Christianity as something that we do. Okay, I'm going to say a sinner's prayer. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And we forget that Christianity is all about a vital and living connection to God, not born simply of a decision that we made, but born of the Spirit's work in our hearts and life and carried through us into other people's lives by the Spirit's work in us. They were connecting to the head and they were connecting to one another. In Nazi Germany, Hitler told all of the religious groups in Germany that they were to organize themselves firmly and to follow his dictates, to follow the dictates of the Nazi party. And at least one group, I'm sure there were many, but at least one group called the Brethren Assemblies had something of an uneven split, about an, or rather about an even split of, of those organizations, those, those churches which followed Hitler's dictates and those churches which opposed Hitler's dictates and would have nothing to do with it. And among those who opposed Hitler's dictates, it said that not one family, not one household didn't have someone who died in a concentration camp. So every family lost somebody by taking that stand. And after the war, after the war, the leaders of the Brethren Assemblies said, we can't have the acrimony, we can't have the infighting, we can't have the, the pressure and the pain that this divide between our group is causing. And these leaders came together for a multi-day prayer retreat 
And instead of talking to one another, instead of airing grievances, instead of trying to work through their difficulties, they simply met in quiet prayer before God and asked the Lord's Spirit to speak into the situation, into their hearts and their lives. Francis Schaeffer, the theologian, records the words of someone who was there, a friend of his. And Francis Schaeffer asked this man, what did you guys do then? Not maybe guys, but what did you do then? And the man responded, we were just one. How could that be? How could it be that groups that had so much difference between them could be completely and totally united. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Who could do that but the Spirit? The Spirit says that we'll know true Christians by their gifts and by their love. And when the Spirit works in our hearts and lives, we will be vitally connected to those around us. And in fact, that's the picture that we see. After this outpouring of the Spirit, we see that there is a vital connection in the early church. Verse 32 says that all the believers were in one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in all of them that they had no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Doesn't that excite you? I don't know how anybody can read something like that and not get excited by it because isn't that what we're really all looking for? Don't we all want to know that somebody's got our back? That somebody's gonna stand there with us? That we really have brothers, that we really have sisters, that we know we can trust them, we can count on them, they're gonna be there for us. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Sure, we're called to proclaim the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We're called to bring people into the family of God. But if that's all we do, and it's just information, Christ was raised from the dead, and they never come into a vital and living community, then somehow we fail. Because the work of the Spirit is not only for the courage to witness to what we've seen and experienced and what matters most, but to bring others into our shared life. What matters most is broader than simply proclaiming the gospel. It's a shared community. What matters most is spirit-filled believers who share the good news and spirit-filled believers who share in the good news. A.W. Tozer in The Pursuit of God writes, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? Let's see if I can do this. Didn't work, but anyway. <laughs> they are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meeting together each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they, were they to become unity conscious and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship with one another. And so God gives community when we look to our head, when we look to Christ, when we look to his spirit, then we, as we grow in the spirit, become vitally connected with one another. Christ in us results in Christ in our relationships. And God's community has the power to accomplish what matters most because it is filled with the Holy Spirit just like the apostles. We go on 
reading about this community in Acts 5, verses 12 through 16. And there we read, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women, believing in the Lord, were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. There's a great story that Christians are vitally connected to. God, the creator, came into the world as Jesus Christ, lived, died, was resurrected as sent his Holy Spirit, but that's not everything. The story goes on into our future, and the story of God tells us that there is a day when all things will be remade. All things will be renewed, refreshed, and restored. And having God's spirit is not only for the here and now. We, as those who are called into his kingdom, as those who are filled with his spirit, are the very first fruits, the first drops of a great rainstorm of renewal, if I can say it that way. And as we open our hearts to God's spirit in our lives, he can renew those things around us. I love the fact that that verse says that all were healed. I love the fact that it says that Peter, as he was walking his shadow, everybody it touched was healed because God's heart and his will is for that renewal to come to all people, to everyone. His desire is that all would be saved that all would come into the family, that all would come into his kingdom. I can imagine as Peter's walking, his shadow wasn't moving so it would miss certain people. All were healed. And that's what really matters. That's what we're called to. We're called to be renewers by and through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, giving us courage, bringing us into community filling us with his power to do his works so that his story will be made complete on this earth. The Spirit draws people to know Christ and it empowers them to be all that God has called them to be. Think about it. When we seek God, we also seek his Spirit because the Spirit is the Holy Spirit the Spirit of God is said in places, the Spirit of Christ in others, the third person of the Trinity. And so, when we seek God and through him the kingdom of God, then all of these other things will be added. And so many times we're running after this thing or that thing or that thing when really what we need is to be seeking what matters most, centering in on what is most important. And so what matters most to you today. Would that it would be the sound of trumpets pealing from heaven through all the ages of the recreated age and calling us forward into our destiny in this life. What wakes you out of bed in the morning? What gets you going? Would that it would be the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, hey, get up. We've got some things to do today. We're gonna do some great stuff, you and me. Would that it would be what matters most in this earth because what matters most is knowing Jesus through the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. It's sharing what we've seen and heard with others. It's living in intentional community and it's living out the unique mission that comes only from the direction of the Spirit vitally alive in our hearts and lives. And now the Bible is clear. If we reach out to God and we ask for the Spirit, God will give us the Spirit. We'll be empowered by Him, for it's, the, the Spirit is God's gift to us. 
And so the question for us is, will we reach out for God's spirit? Will we ask him to come into our hearts? Will we ask him to come into our lives? Will we pray and, and say, Holy Spirit, help me to attend to what matters most. Help my heart be set on what matters most. Transform me. Change me. Renew me that I can renew others through a vital connection with the living God. And so that's the question. Will we cry out to God for the Holy Spirit? And before we answer that, because we have most likely many of us already gotten an answer yes or no to that set in our minds, in our hearts, in our thoughts, from our history. Before we answer a question that I really believe all of heaven leans in to hear each heart, their answer for that. Let me suggest that we should not just answer out of whatever knee-jerk reaction, whatever history we have, but if we really want God's Spirit in our lives, and even if we've walked in the Spirit for years and years and we want God in our lives in a new way, I think the cry of our heart should be, yes, I want that. And we may have to will to want that. But as heaven leans in, I, I beg you to want that. Because God can't use us unless we allow him into our hearts and into our lives. Our lives.